I guess what we're doing here today is kind of holding on to summer, right? We've got a really nice, warm room to discuss hot topics in machine learning today. Um, so the thermostat on that wall says it's 79, and I told it that I wanted it to be 69, and uh, now it's saying it's 79.1. So this is what happens when machines become autonomous, you know, and they're, they're not well trained and not well coded. So this is a lesson. Um, so uh, if anyone feels like they're getting ready to like pass out or something, or, you know, you've got some like paper towels here, you can wipe the sweat from your brow. Um, okay, so some quick announcements. Uh, AWS codes, should all be out. I think there's one person that still had a problem. We have a very complicated system which involves like several professors and TAs and multiple spreadsheets and different computer systems. But I think we might have gotten everybody. Does anyone still need a AWS code? Two people? All right. Buwan is the guy you should contact. Ping Buwan. We'll sort it out. Um, yeah? Oh, you got him today. All right. Okay, um, Okay. so the wait list is almost looking manageable. I know it's after the ad deadline, I'll sign things. I think other people have to sign things, but really it's kind of up to me. Um, so uh, there are like 25 people still on the wait list uh, for 605. There are a bunch of people on the wait list for 805 that haven't sent me their CVs. I haven't checked to see how many duplicates there are. Um, there are about 15 slots, okay. Uh, so it's getting, it's getting sort of manageable. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wait until early next week because um, my experience is people drop kind of after the first deadline. Um, that's sort of the last wave of drops. So my guess is probably the wait list will clear and everybody that's still kind of hanging in there will get in. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so uh, I mentioned this Tuesday, the project deadlines for 805 have been posted. First one's not too long. Um, you should be thinking about working in a team. Um, so I recommend, I think the optimal team size is like two or three. That's sort of enough um, people that you can sort of split things up and you, know, you can collaborate and kind of have fun. It's good to work in a team. You, know, it's, uh, you learn a lot from your classmates, all of that stuff. Um, uh, if you want to do, um, a singleton project, just you, then that's probably okay. I'd like to know that that's your plan uh, in advance. Um, uh, and um, uh, there's some other instructions specifically for people that are doing a project. Uh, so basically, you know, short story, you know, have the data and have an idea of what you want to do within a couple of weeks. I'll take a week or so and give you. Um, feedback on that, um, and then you'll give me sort of like a final plan a week or so after my feedback, okay? So, uh, so that's the basic plan. Um, on uh, Monday, I will be in beautiful and exciting White Plains, New York, okay? And then LaGuardia Airport and, you know, God willing, Pittsburgh Airport. Um, so I'm not going to have my regular office hours on Monday, okay? Uh, so that's it for announcements. Are there any like administrative questions before I jump ahead? Okay. All right, so um, Tuesday, I told you what we're gonna do for like the next few lectures. Um, we're basically gonna be talking about algorithms that you can implement using these sort of MapReduce systems, okay? Um, I talked through one in a, a lot of detail, an algorithm for testing a huge naive Bayes classifier where nothing fits in memory. The data set doesn't fit in memory. The classifier doesn't sit in fit in memory. So you basically have to um, uh, artfully move the data around uh, uh, so that you can uh, do the operations you need to do, okay? So uh, I also kind of sketched an algorithm for Rokio. I talked about how you'd basically do a TF-IDF representation of documents and then how you could use that to build a Rokio classifier. Um, so if you think about what I'm doing, um, the uh, uh, next assignment, all right, the last assignment is due on Sunday at midnight, 
Okay, the next assignment is actually going out today. So you have time to look at it and think about it. Um, so uh, the next assignment is going out today. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so the next assignment is basically doing this naive Bayes um, classification algorithm on disk that I talked about Tuesday. Um, and of course, that algorithm actually could be extended very easily. Um, you know, that core algorithm could be used for any, you know, large um, in-memory, uh, on-disk um, linear classifier uh, with only modest uh, changes. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about a bunch of different algorithms. I'm going to continue talking about the other thing we talked about on Tuesday, which is abstractions for MapReduce. So I talked about some of these abstractions. I talked a little bit about how you'd implement them. So um, most of these things, it's pretty obvious how you map these into map reduced, pardon the pun. Um, so uh, there's a map operation uh, where you basically change each row with some function. There's a filter operation, which where you filter things out of a row. Uh, there's this flattening operation uh, where you take something like, let's say, a sequence of tokenized documents. So each row in your table is a tokenized document, and you turn it into just a long sequence of tokens. Um, and then there were some things which correspond much more closely to a map reduce operation. So there's a grouping operation, which is what you do. You generate a key, and then you sort things. That's a, that's a way of grouping things. So this is basically that kind of operation that happens in the um, shuffle sort phase uh, in a map reduce operation. Okay. And I also talked about another very useful abstraction, the join. Okay. So join is a way of basically moving information or collecting information, aligning information in two tables. It's a database concept. There are a couple of different ways of implementing this. One is with a map side join, one is a reduced side join. I talked about those Tuesday. So this is kind of where we are. Um, so today, uh, we're going to take these abstractions and make them less abstract. I'm going to talk about some very concrete implementations of these abstractions. All right. So that's the plan for today. Uh, so we're basically going to talk about a couple of uh, implementations. Um, one is called pig, uh, and the other one is called guinea pig. Uh, so I'm going to be kind of going back and forth between them. Uh, and let's start with pig, which is the one that everybody uses in industry, or the kind of most widely used one in industry. All right, so this is a concrete implementation of these, um, these operations. So this is, um, this sort of language is often called a data flow language, all right? So you know, each one of your primitive steps here is describing how you're going to transform data. And um, uh, uh, that's, you know, separate from a kind of normal imperative language where you describe in more detail at a lower level what you want to do. And that's also different from a more declarative language, right? So you can imagine describing the word count um, uh, example, right? Or even a more complicated thing like the naive Bayes classification task. You can imagine describing that just as a database query in SQL. Right. If you're good at SQL, you could do it that way. And then you're leaving everything, all the implementation details to the, um, to the system, and you're providing a, a declarative description. So this is somewhere in between. So we have these abstract steps, um, but we sort of choose the sequence, the ordering of those steps. Um, so uh, this is an example of a program in pig. So pig is actually the name of the system. The uh, programming language is called pig Latin. Um, and um, this is basically the word count example, example that we, we know and love so much. All right, so this basically says we're going to load a data file here. Um, and um, for each one of these things, we're going to generate some transformation of this. All right, then we're going to filter this. We're going to group things by word. We're going to count the number of things in each group. All right. And then we're going to order it. So this is actually going to give us a list of um, the rarest words. Uh, oh, the most frequent words first. OK. Uh, OK. Um, I think, come back to this. In the quiz, I might have said you switch. Well, 
I'll, I'll post something about that. Um, the quiz I may have like switched ascending and descending. Let me, I'll have to double check that. Okay. So a program in pig or a program in pig Latin is basically a bunch of assignments. Um, the left hand of every assignment is a relation. Okay. So it's the name of an, uh, a set of things. Um, in most cases, the ordering of things in that set doesn't matter. Um, and in most cases, uh, you've abstracted away from uh, the way that um, data is actually physically stored. So typically in a pig program, each one of these A, B, C, D, E, F relations is going to be stored on HDFS as a big sharded file. Okay, so it'll be stored in a distributed way, and these transformations are going to be things that you'll do in a distributed way with MapReduce steps. Question? What's LHS? LSA, uh, that stands for left hand side. So the thing to the left of the equal sign. Okay. All right, so the, the types of everything are basically all the same. All right, so in Pig Latin, there are sort of a bunch of things that are kind of built in. Uh, so you have atomic types like a string and a, you know, an integer. Um, and you have compound types that are built up from those. So there's a tuple, um, there's a bag, there's a map type, which is sort of like a dictionary in Python or a hash map in Java. Uh, you can execute this in Hadoop. Uh, you can also execute programs locally, just the same way you can run a Hadoop program locally. Um, so pig programs are always executed using a Hadoop backend. Um, when you're running locally, though, you can do things on your local uh, file system and so on. Um, uh, so uh, pig is sort of designed to be an embedded language, so it's missing some things you may want in a real application. For example, you know, conditionals or loops. Um, but you can embed it in Java to get around that, um, just like you can embed an SQL program, an X SQL query in, in uh, your favorite language. Um, and you can also call out to Java from pig. Um, so let's, let's just kind of talk through some of these steps. Um, so first we load this. Uh, uh, so this is going to give us um, some relation, uh, kind of by default here, uh, each entry in this relation is just going to be a string. Okay, uh, so dollar zero is the name of that string here. Okay, so when I say tokenize um, uh, the character, uh, this thing converting it to a character array, then I'm basically breaking that into a set of words. This is some built-in function in pig. There's a fair number of built-in functions. You can use define your own functions in Java and link into them if you're if you're missing one. Okay, so flatten is kind of weird. All right. Flatten uh, is um, the analog of doing the flatten in a map step. And it basically applies to the next step of the process. So here we're going to generate not lists of tokens, but flattened lists of tokens. All right, and we're calling them, uh, and the, this is going to be stored in the relation B. All right, um, so the fundamental elements in a relation in pig have fields. So this is the name of the field. So the things in B are going to have one field called word. OK. So now this next line makes a little bit of sense. Filter B by word matches that thing. So this is, again, built in machinery. Um, you're using a regular expression match here. So if you know your regular expressions, this is basically looking for things that are alphabetic. Or no, I guess just sequences of word characters. All right. So uh, that's, that's uh, that simple. All right. And then we're grouping uh, C by word. So what does that mean? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to construct a new set of tuples that are um, uh, a new set of, of rows um, in the next relation, D. All right. Um, so uh, that relation always has a few special fields. So the set of things that you've grouped together um, uh, are um, uh, stored in the field group. Okay, so uh, uh, so what does that mean here? So uh, the next step here, we're going to look at everything in D. So we're going to go for each row, and we're going to generate um, uh, a record which has two elements. One's going to be called count, and one's going to be called word. All right, group is the thing that we group together. Okay, right, and. Uh, C is basically a counter, right? So this is going to be the count of the number of instances of that word. All right. 
Um, the last thing is we're going to order it by the counts descending, so we'll have the most frequent words first, and we'll write it out. Okay. Professor, yeah. Are we iterating in the second step, the line or file? Uh, in this step right here. Yeah. You're iterating over lines in the file, right? So there, actually, there are a bunch of different ways to load things in, but kind of the default thing, it's going to load things in sort of but string by string, where each string is a line. But what if we load a pass instead of a file in the first step? Uh, in this case, is we are still iterating by line by line? Yeah, you would be iterating line by line. There's, but I mean, there are ways we can control that, right? So you can load things in different formats as well. So Pig's actually pretty good about loading things in different formats. So in particular, you can load pretty much any kind of Hadoop writable thing um, uh, in, uh, in, in Pig. So yeah, question? No. Okay, they don't correspond immediately to a MapReduce job. Okay, they don't, or they don't respond one and one to a MapReduce job. Okay, so this is a, that's a great question. Okay, um, so pig is basically a language that's designed to be optimized. Okay, in fact, you can use pig interactively. There's an interpreter called grunt. And when you type these things in, basically nothing is going to happen at any point except that it's going to take that next step and say, oh, okay, I'm going to add this to basically my execution plan, all right? And there's some small number of things, and this one I think store is the first one. There's some small number of things that force pig to actually go and execute things, all right? So when you type store, it's going to look at its current execution plan. It will optimize it as much as it can, all right? And then it's going to take that optimized thing and execute it and do the store, all right? So it's a lazy operation. Okay. One thing that's a little bit frustrating about pig when you're using it um, is uh, when you're using it interactively, it's sometimes hard a little bit hard to predict whether it's just going to be like carriage return. It's that it's the execution time, no delay, or it's going to spawn off some map reduce thing. And you're like, whoa, guess it's time to go get a soda. There was another question. Yeah. Um, when you're talking about relations, like you said, A through F are relations. Yes. Yeah, so that's a good, so to what extent are these things like, um, like database relations, to what extent are these things just to like an unordered set of like objects, right? So um, they're like the rows in a database in that they all have fields, okay? okay? Um, you, they're not, you know, indexed, they're kind of designed to be streaming, to, for you to stream through them, so there's no indexing step. Um, and, um, you know, it's a fairly, Lightweight. It's, it's also the case that you can have things that are sort of like um, some sort of nested object. So the field, one of the fields could be, let's say, um, a tuple, right? And the tu tuple could have tuples inside it. Okay. All right. But, but you're naming the fields here. Right? You're naming the fields with that as, right? Kind of like an SQL. All right. Also, just to jump ahead a little bit, when I explain the syntax of pig, so I've done this a couple years now. When I explain the syntax of pig, people are confused. When I think about the syntax of pig, I'm also confused. So the assignment you're going to do is not going to use pig, but it's going to have something a little bit tighter and cleaner, which we're going to get to in a couple of slides. All right, a little bit later on. OK, so let's, I, I guess the, the strategy here is I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about sort of the technical details of pig, although those are all both great questions, because um, uh, I want to kind of move on to the stuff that you're going to need for the assignment. All right, so this is, this is Pig's example. Here's some other things that you can do. Uh, so there's a, load, there's a load as where you can give it a schema. So you can basically tell it how you want to structure the data. Um, the map process is basically for each, and then there's the name of some relation. Generate, all right, and then you basically describe a new row, right, by naming the fields, right, and say how to compute each field. Um, this we'll talk about it a little bit, but it's got some nice tools for sort of debugging what you're doing and understanding what are the structures that you're creating. Um, so uh, you can do a group, all right? Uh, and um, often in a group, after a group, 
you'll do something which includes some transformation of that data with like a for each, all right, and uh, some sort of aggregation like a sum or a count, all right. So the um, the uh, kind of pig convention for expressing a map reduce is you'll have a group and then a generate, right? And the generate is what actually does the reduce operation. Um, and those things get optimized together, which is important because you have a program like this. You don't actually want to put, create an object which is a group of all the instances of each word if you can avoid it. It would be better to sort of as quickly as possible go to what you really need, which is just the number of things. Um, so there's a join, and you can control how that join works. Um, there's a cross product, which, which is like a join, except you don't have any keys. So you just pair up everything every other way. You usually don't want to do that. Sometimes you have to. Um, uh, and um, uh, you can also, like I said, you can extend this so it's pretty easy to write a user-defined function as a new operator. Um, or you can write a user um, uh, loader, or you can write a new um, uh, aggregation operator, it's a fairly extensible language. Um, so, and, and I guess the key thing is when you're thinking about where the map reduces are, they're usually it's a sequence where there's a group and then a for each and then some aggregation. Yes? So, when you type in load, nothing is going to happen, right? If you're doing it interactively, that's basically the first step of the plan. It tells you where to get the data, typically off HDFS. Right, so usually it's a path in HDFS. So that's basically specifying, you know, like your input for a map reduce process, for a Hadoop process. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? This one. Yes. Yeah, it's the previous C, right? So you're grouping this by word. So you're counting the number of things um, in, I guess, uh, let's see. So uh, there's, um, they're basically, in the output of this, they're basically two, um, in each element of the output of that, in each record in the output, there are two objects. One is going to be named C, and one is going to be named group. Like I said, it's a little confusing. Um, so in this particular case, the optimizer is going to compress these steps into one map reduce. Um, and it's actually going to compress this whole sequence into one map reduce. So you can basically do all this. You can flatten, filter, um, and then do the grouping basically in one map step. All right? Grouping by word is just basically you know, using those as keys, right? Um, and then in the reduce step, you're going to basically produce the count. So re you'll reduce the list of things to a count. Um, and the optimizer will do that. Okay. All right. So here's a bigger example. All right. So just kind of going back to my um, kind of abstract um, notation. I had a couple of operators map, join, right? Map is like generate, join is like um, join, group by. And I had some extra syntax, which basically let you specify um, a map reduce operation. And then distinct is going to um, remove duplicates. So this is a two slide uh, implementation. So we take the data and we first um, do, uh, we first basically, um, I'm starting out with pairs like this. So that my da original data, I just have a doc ID and a term, a doc ID and a term. So it's just a, a big pile of pairs, OK? So I've already done a little bit of pre-processing in my model. So we take these things, we eliminate duplicates, and then I basically, um, you know, do a document, a term count process in there. Uh, so this will now tell me what the um, what the um, um, document frequency is of every term. So document frequency is going to is going to be pairs like this, okay. Then uh, I'm going to take all the document IDs, all right, and I'm going to count how many there are. So it's the same sort of story. I'll basically group them by some constant function. That's a one here, all right. And we'll end up, uh, after I do my map reduce, um, so the key will be this constant that I used in my, my, my key. And then the sum will be the number of documents, okay. 
Uh, so here I actually just want to have one reducer because I want at the end of the day, I just want to get one single count for the number of documents. All right, then I'm going to take um, the uh, document term and the document frequencies and join them together. All right, and after I join them, I'm going to um, reformat that. Uh, let's see, so this is the aggregation. I forgot about that, uh, that we're doing. Um, that's that thing. After I do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a couple of uh, joins here. So I'm going to join in the document frequency. All right, and then once I get that join, the output of this join will just be, you know, a pair where the first element is the first row and the second uh, is the first relation. Second element is from the second relation. So the pair looks like this. I've got a document ID and a term and a term and a document frequency, right, from these two relations. Um, and I'm going to basically turn those into triples you know, discarding the extra term. All right, so now at the end of the day, I've got things where I've got a document ID, a term, and the document frequency. All right, now I'm gonna just do a little bit of math, okay? So I've got um, this number of documents, which I need to compute the um, inverse document frequency. All right, so I, I pull that in by doing a join. All right, then again, I'm gonna do this little replacement of the output of the join, so I get triples again. So now I've got document ID term and the, um, the IDF of the term, okay? So this is that vector U I had, the unnormalized document vector, all right? Um, and now I'm gonna basically compute the sum of squares for each of those guys, all right? Uh, so I can normalize things, and then I'm gonna basically take that, those normalizers which are indexed by document ID, do a join, and now I can actually sort of give you the normalized thing, all right, again, as a set of triples, all right? So that's the process I proposed in this abstract syntax, okay? And at the end of the day, I'll get something like this. I've got the document and the term. I've got the local weight of that term in that document, okay? Um, uh, right, and I guess the normalizers look like this. It's the same thing, but I've got the sum of squares. Okay, so this is an implementation of TFIDF uh, conversion to TFIDF in pig. I didn't write this, I just found this on the web. It's not using exactly the same uh, algorithm, but it's pretty close. Uh, so we start out, this is defining a function which takes some parameters. So wherever these parameters get used, we have a dollar sign in front. So um, we're going to go through everything in the input relation, flatten and tokenize, uh, and uh, get the document ID, all right? So this is basically the data that I started with, okay? Uh, and the data here is called token records. Uh, then I'm gonna take these token records, which are basically a document ID and a token. And so in my implementation, I kind of ignored term frequency. Here we're actually gonna look at term frequency. So we wanna count the number of times each token appears in this document. Uh, so this is one line in pig, although there's actually a couple of steps here. There's a group that's been done sort of as an, you know, an internal uh, parenthesized substep here, okay? So you do this grouping and then you go through each of these things and you generate um, a flattened version of this, okay? Um, so essentially what we're doing is we're getting the ID field and tokens, right? And then you count those together, all right? Um, so uh, this gives us the, total number of times each token appears in each document. We do something similar to get the document size. All right, uh, now we just do some simple transformation. So here we're going through each one of these term counts and we take the ID field um, and just copy it over. We take the token and just copy it over and we're um, taking this doc total value and this doc size value um, and we're making that, uh, we're dividing, and that's our term frequency, all right? So this is actually a number. Um, and doc total and document size here are our counts um, that we computed here and here. Um, then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna compute the document frequency. So this is another one of these like counting operations. Um, <laughs> So we're going through and basically, um, uh, uh, again, going through grouping things by, um, by token so we can figure out uh, how many, uh, 
how many times uh, uh, the tokens appear in different documents. All right. Um, and now we finally get one overall count for all the documents, which is just what we did before. OK. So this will generate a record. And it just has one field total docs. And the name of the record is end docs. All right. And then here's something that's really weird. So rather than doing a join to take this record and merge it in with all this other stuff, um, pig, um, it, pig, it used to be that you would do it that way. Um, and now what you do is um, what you do is you take this relation. Um, and if that relation just has a single value in it, then basically what you just have is you have, you know, you could, it's essentially a bunch of scalars with a naming convention, right? One field, each field is a different scalar, right? So you can actually take those scalars and you can, um, you can name them here. It will basically take that and figure out that that has to be a scalar and put the right thing in, all right? So this is getting the um, actual TFIDF computation here. And um, uh, again, this is sort of showing what you can do with the syntax. You can basically go through each one of these things. And there's a sequence of three steps here. The last one is generate. So you do these little preliminary calculations, and then you do the generate. OK. So that's what you do um, in this implementation. All right. So. Uh, what I'm going to do now, oh, oh, oh and, and let me let me kind of like mention a couple of things about pig. Um, so uh, when you use pig, you'll find there are some things which are surprisingly hard to keep track of. Okay, one thing that's hard to keep track of, and this is true for every data flow language, is basically what do you have at each point. All right, so here I put these little documents here. Or these little this, these little things here, so I could say, well, at this point we've got a document ID, a token, a term frequency, and the length of that document, right? So I've sort of added more and more fields to this little relation, okay? Um, so I put this here just so you can kind of follow along, um, but um, I, Pig has its own way of. Um, I, Introducing fields to denote the output of a join and the output of a group. Um, if you forget to name something, it'll come up with a, an arbitrary name. So you can use things like dollar zero um, if you don't have a name for things. Um, uh, so it's often hard to kind of keep track of what each of these temporary um, relations hold and what they look like, and that's an easy way to make a mistake. Okay, um, that's an easy type of error to make. Uh, uh, so one thing uh, that um, Pig lets you do, and it actually is a pretty nice job with this, is it lets you, um, even as you're basically just kind of going through um, without executing anything, before you execute something, you can ask for information about the schema for things. Okay, so this is another program. I, I'm sorry I didn't do it for the TFIDF thing, but um, you know, here's a relation called foreground phrases, and it's telling you what's in it. OK, so it's a record. There's one field called x, y, which, has got, which is a pair. There's an x and a y, and those are both byte arrays, basically strings. All right, and there's another field c, which is an integer. OK, and if I ask it to illustrate that, OK, then what it will do, even if it hasn't actually executed things, it'll run through a little bit of a, a small sample of the data to give you an indication of what sorts of things might be in that table. So if you're trying to figure out, well, what's x and what's y, right, then you can, um, you can, you can, you can call um, this illustrate command, and it will give you, you know, what looks like, in its ASCII graphics-y sort of way, what looks like an illustration in a database book that tells you what the structure of that thing is. All right, so FG phrases is going to look like this, all right, there's one value here and there's one value here. And to, to figure out what it was, it had to construct an FG phrases one, which has this other value. OK. So this is one nice thing that, uh, that pig has. All right. So um, I used pig a couple of years ago for this class for an assignment. Um, and a lot of people didn't like it. And um, I, I actually, you know, as a professor, um, you want to introduce students to the kind of core concepts, um, but you don't want them to spend a lot of time in the classes where they're really kind of focused on learning things, dealing with sort of 
you know, whatever the ugly words to idiosyncrasies are of, you know, the tool that you've chosen to illustrate that. So, um, so I taught students how to do pig, but a lot of students didn't, weren't happy about it. And I wasn't all that happy about it myself. Um, so um, I spent some time doing something which is much more lightweight, um, less scalable, but um, a bit easier and cleaner to understand. Uh, so guinea pig is basically something a lot like pig. It's implemented in Python, OK? It's, it's very lightweight. It's less than 1,500 lines for some version. I'm not sure what version. It might be a little bit more than that now. Less than 2,000, let's say, OK? Um, what it does is um, what it streams through every relation is just a Python data structure. How many people in this class have used Python? Okay, how many people have not used Python? Okay, you guys are gonna have a great time, right? It's a lovely, it's a beautiful little language. It's a very useful thing to know. Um, so uh, it, it streams Python data structures, okay? So there's no um, idiosyncratic language to learn for tuples and bags and maps and so on. It's basically just what, let, let's, what Python lets you write down. Um, and those structures are actually pretty easy to read. So a tuple is just parentheses with commas. A list is just um, uh, with square brackets instead of parentheses. Okay. Um, so there are, no there are no records. There's no notion of a record. Everything that you operate on is basically just a Python object. Um, so um, there are basically two back ends uh, for guinea pig. All right. And this was also done deliberately to kind of make a pedagogical point. So you can either compile something to a sequence of shell commands, right? And those shell commands basically involve calling a Python program to do the, um, the separate steps of the computation and sorts, all right? So they're basically just stream and sort commands. And then they run purely locally. You can run them on you know, a laptop, anything that will support Python and has access to like Unix sort, okay? So you can run them on a Mac. Um, or a Linux box, um, or you can turn it into um, uh, a Hadoop streaming pipeline. So you can also run it on the cluster in Hadoop. Um, so when you're doing it locally, it's actually very easy to look at the intermediate results, okay? Um, and it's also easy to look at parts of a pipeline. So um, uh, this is kind of my page for guinea pig. There's a tutorial. Um, a bunch of examples, and I kind of encourage you guys to kind of look through that to get started. Okay, um, so some advantages of this. So, um, so the things in Pig aren't tremendously complicated, but they're a little bit different from most other languages. Um, so there's a whole new set of operations like tokenize, and you have to kind of figure out what the semantics of those are, um, uh, for example. Uh, so there's kind of an overhead in looking those things up when you're coding. Um, so this basically just deals with Python data structure, so there's no new you know, field, you know, regular expression notations and what have you to learn. Okay? You don't have to like, worry about how to construct UDFs, you just write a Python thing. Um, so um, uh, you can always store an intermediate result and look at it if you want. Okay? And I've also put in code to let you look at pieces of the plan that gets constructed. So you can also see that at any point. Um, I, so, um, and there's also um, kind of a trade-off. So it has high-level operations, but it also has this extended group by operation, which really kind of lets you specify um, more or less precisely what you want to do in a MapReduce step. Um, OK, so, so that's basically the idea. OK, um, here's, the, here's uh, some examples. OK, so can you guys in the back see that OK, this slide? No? All right, I apologize for that. Um, I, we may be able to kind of get by a little bit. Um, so uh, I, may, I may actually jump over and like put some things up on the screen too, and get, get things larger. All right, so, um, so one trade-off is you basically have to take your, um, your, um, your uh, your description of the data flow operations, and you have to embed them in a, like a little Python template. So the template looks like this. Um, you always start out by um, importing a couple of routines. All right. Then you put whatever you know UDF user functions you want to put in here. So I've got something 
which basically takes a line and enumerates all the tokens in it. All right. Um, and then uh, uh, to construct your data flow plan, you construct a subclass of planner. All right. And then there's always this thing at the end. So your main program basically always looks like this. All right. So this is what a program looks like. And you can sort of see what this is. It says read lines from corpus, flattened by tokens, um, which is this function here, and then group by the identity function, and then there's a reduced account function. Um, this is um, a, a different plugin for this. Um, so this is sort of a concise way of writing these steps. You just put bars in between them. Uh, and uh, um, a, um, a more pig-like detailed way of doing it is to basically say, for lines, you read lines from this file. So that has no inputs. For words, you flatten the lines. All right. So the first argument here when you use this vertical bar is by default whatever is to the left. All right. Um, and then to do the word count, you group the words, that's this thing, by this, these functions. You guys can read that down there, right? OK. Um, so um, what this gets converted to, all right, um, is a um, object, all right? So this is a planner object. So I create that object right here. Um, and um, I can look at what this object is, right? So this is basically sort of the structure of that object. There's a group function. All right, and its main input is this flattened object, okay? And the input of the flattened object is this read lines object. All right. So um, the class variables in this planner are data structures, lines, words, and words are data structures, and you can sort of inspect these, okay? So the other thing that looks a little bit um, um, obscure here is this reducing to count um, thing. So that's a built-in thing in guinea pig, but it's easy to write your own. Um, so um, you could also define this as basically a new reduced to object, all right? And that takes arguments that basically takes two functions. So one is a function that gives you sort of the base case. If there's zero operations in the list of things you're reducing, um, then you construct um, the base case by just calling that function with no um, operators. So if I say int with no arguments in Python, it will return zero. Um, and then this is a function which takes your running um, aggregation and a new value and tells you how to um, combine them. All right, so if we're just counting, we just add one. Um, okay, so maybe let's um, see. OK. Um, OK. So this is the program, OK? And just to sort of give you an idea for how you run this. Um, so the only thing I really need here for this to work is, is guinea pig. I need guinea pig.py to be on my path, on my Python path. Here it's just in this directory, which works. All right. Um, and the way I invoke this is I just invoke my little main program here. Um, if I do it without any arguments, it will give me a little bit of a help. All right, so it sort of tells you what the options are. Uh, one of them is list, right? So list will tell you what are the intermediate data structures that you've defined. Um, uh, if, you, if they don't correspond to things that have like a name in Python, it'll sort of make up a name for them. All right, um, and um, I can also look at what one of these data structures is. So if I want to look at the word count data structure, right, then I'll get this, OK? So this is a little bit hard to read, right? It's just some unknown little function here. It doesn't know how to describe that. But word count takes words as input and lines. Um, I can also sort of find out exactly what this is going to get compiled to. Oops. if I can type, which I can't, apparently, right? So these are the tasks. Um, so this is the first task, there's only one, right? And it sort of tells you what the different steps are, all right? And then I'm doing this in, um, in uh, you know, kind of local mode, all right? So it tells me what the shell command is that will do that. Um, so the way this um, system will actually execute the individual steps, um, is it will 
call your main program, okay? So it constructs a shell program that's going to call your main program again recursively, all right? And with a little bit of extra uh, um, arguments. So typically there's a do operation which basically tells you what it's going to do, all right, and what view it needs to do it for. So these things basically define the step, okay? And this is where it gets its input from, then it does a sort, and then it does another operation here, and then it writes it out to a, a place, all right? So if I tell it to store that, then it will go ahead and um, um, execute that, and um, where it's stored is in this, by default, um, subdirectory gpig views, all right? And um, it's always stored by the name of the Python pro variable you gave it. Um, so uh, with a dot gp um, argument. So this is what you've got, all right? So it is outputting here um, uh, uh, um, Python objects. They're all tuples. Um, the first one is a string, and actually this is a little bit confusing because some of these strings start off with a single quote. I, maybe I should do the tail of this. Those will probably look normal. All right, all right, so Zionism, here's a good one. All right, so uh, the first thing is a string, and the second one is just a count. All right. Okay. Um, So this is uh, pretty much what I just said. Oh, okay. Um, let's jump to something a little bit more complicated. Um, what was that one called? Oh, maybe I can figure it out. Uh, was it? Oh, wait. Nope, that's not it. Um, okay. So here's a tremendously more complicated program. What this does is it does word count for two corpus, corpora, and then it compares the results. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so I've got, I've, oh, and uh, the comparison you know, is this little function right here. So it's basically giving me um, the log of um, the fraction of times it appears in corpus one versus the total number of times it occurs. All right. So uh, that's, um, that, so, so how do, what does that look like? Um, so since everything, all the class variables are just, um, are just Python structures, I can actually write a little routine that will generate um, uh, a structure if there's something I want to reuse, okay? So this little function takes a file name and returns a, a, a structure, right? So it re returns a, um, a, a guinea pig view definition that reads lines, flattens, and then does the word count thing, all right? So I've got two of these things, a pipe for the red corpus and one for the blue corpus, okay? Um, and then I've got another little um, definition here. So I'm gonna join those two things so the join syntax is a little awkward. Um, so the join um, argument takes two um, objects called join inputs, J-I-N. All right, each one of those has um, the name of a relation and then a function which defines the key. So I'm gonna get the key for each of these things. All right. Um, and then I'm gonna replace each of these things. Um, so I'm gonna, this is basically a map. I could have actually used map here if I wanted, but phrase map, but this is a kind of old syntax. Um, and um, uh, what, out, what the output of the join is basically, the input of the join is these two pairs, okay? So it's a word and a count pair here, all right? And it's a word and a count pair here, all right? Um, and um, the arguments here then would be a pair where I've got a word and a count, all right? So this is one reason why Python is a nice thing for describing, uh, for using this thing. So. In Python, when you write a lambda function, or indeed any function, um, uh, the arguments can actually be um, a complicated thing, right? They can actually be a pattern, a bunch of tuples um, with variables inside those tuples. And um, when you call that function on something which matches that pattern, 
And that's going to go ahead and bind the variable word one to the thing here and n one to the thing there and so on and so forth. All right. So that's a special structure in Python. I don't know of any other language. Well, I don't know of many other languages that have that. Um, uh, but it makes it very convenient to define these things. Um, uh, and then the output will just be a function which just has the word and then, you know, these, that score function. All right. Um, and then uh, format is basically just like a replace, except it, it sort of knows that it's not going to write the output as a, um, as a um, Python data structure, um, but actually as a, as a string. All right. So it'll take that and um, uh, um, basically take this argument, the, um, this uh, this this um, this uh, final output of the join, um, and uh, convert that to a string. And this is using Python string formatting routines. All right, so let's kind of take a look at what this thing does. So if I say Python word comp, uh, let's say, um, and I want to say what the what was the format here um, result looks like. All right. So this is what the data structure looks like. All right, this is what the um, uh, plan looks like. All right, this is what the tasks look like. All right. So it's broken this into um, three different MapReduce tasks. All right. So you can kind of guess what they are. One of them is the first word count. The other one's the second word count. The last one's the join. Okay, so it's saying, saying it's going to store these things, you know, word count one and word count two. All right, join these through, join these two. And at the end of the day, there's um, this, uh, this process here. Now, um, what it's actually doing here when it's doing a join is it's doing a reduce side join. So it takes these two um, inputs, um, um, appends them together, doing some special sorting. So it sorts on the first two fields. Um, and then it, it does the machinery for the join. Yeah, question. Uh, two questions. So when you have these commands, like C string or test stuff, are they, uh, did you write them yourself or is it provided in PIP? Uh, yeah, so pprint and tasks are, uh, are provided. They're built in. Okay, so and I thought you write like vertical bars in, in your Python syntax. Is it also a syntax from PIP or? Yes, that's also provided. So it's like sort of a shortcut syntax. So you don't have to define intermediate variables for everything, right? So it's supposed to look like a pipe, right? A Unix pipe. And it, you basically, whatever's on the right-hand side of that pipe takes whatever's on the left-hand side as its first input, first argument. Um, so I can also like look and see if I just want to see what the shell commands are going to be. I can see this, okay? So um, uh, what it's going to do, it's going to do this, then this execute, this shell command, and this shell command, and this shell command, and so on and so forth. This is kind of nice because um, sometimes when you run one of these commands, your Python code will have a bug in it, and it will fail when it's um, executing one of these subcommands. And you can actually sort of go in and just sort of re-execute that if you want. Um, so that's, a, that's an option for debugging. Um, uh, if I want to go ahead and store this, we can sort of see what it looks like. Um, these are kind of small things. So um, if I had, this is what the scores look like. Um, and um, uh, I can also look in here and see like what the first word count looks like or the second word count looks like. So well, those are all things um, I can look at. Um, so if I look inside this, not everything is going to get stored. Okay. Oh, there's been a whole bunch of stuff in here that got stored. Let me just remove all these things. This is old stuff. Let me just see what's actually stored for these particular um, um, cases. Right. Oops. Oh, I did it wrong here. Um, Let's do it straight. Okay. Oh, uh, it's okay. Uh, 
Oh, I, I know what it's, uh, hang on a second here. These are the things that are actually used here, right? So the only things I actually um, saw in my computation here, okay, there are several different things, and we've got the word count one and word count two, and this result thing. If I wanted to see, for example, what, the, um, what this intermediate thing is, this CMP variable, I can just ask it to store that, right? And then look at those. Um, so that's the sort of underlying Python thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, um, the, um, the full syntax for group is probably worth talking about a little bit. So there are three arguments here. Um, so um, uh, one is by. So that's basically pulling out the key you're going to use for the grouping. All right. And this, basically, this corresponds one to one to a MapReduce process. OK, in the MapReduce process, what you'd be doing is you'd be going through, you'd be outputting a key and a value. All right. And it's going to sort things together so that, say, that everything with the same key sort of gets um, output. So, um, so the default thing that's the value will just be the identity function. So you'll group by the whole row um, or the whole object. Um, but you can, over, you can specify that here we're going to basically use as a key the first um, uh, k letters of the word. So we could like, just use, say, like, sort things by the first letter of the word or the first two letters of the word. Um, I, then you say retaining. So this is what part of the, so by default, um, when you do a group by, then the output will be um, uh, a set of objects. And they'll all be pairs. The first argument of the pair will be the key you use to group by. And the second argument will be a list of all the values that go along with that key. Um, so, um, and the values by default, the values are whatever is output by retaining. Okay, by default, again, the value is the whole row. Okay, um, but you can decide to just keep a little bit of it. So let's say I've got a whole bunch of word counts that I've constructed, and what I basically want to do is I want to sort of see which, you know, one letter prefixes are most common. So I can ask, uh, make the, the by field be just the first letter, so K would be one. All right, and then I would just key, take the count of that word. Okay, so I've got the first letter is my key, and, and the, the counts will be the values. All right, and then finally there's the aggregation, the reduce command, right? So this would basically give me um, uh, a count by, by prefix, okay? And again, this, um, uh, you, 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 can, um, you can do this by writing a slightly more complicated reducing to function, right? So rather than just saving the count, you could do the default, which is to save um, the word count pair, that's what the input to that would be, all right? And then you could write a different reducer where basically, you know, you're, you're accumulating integers and whenever you take a new word count pair, you just basically add the count, right? So that would also work. Um, but this is a little bit efficient and sometimes a little bit uh, e easier to see what's going on. Okay, so questions on this? Can you the reduce to? So um, reduce to is an object, OK? Um, and there are a handful of um, objects that are provided in guinea pig. One is reduced to sum, and one is reduced to count, all right? Um, and um, the way they work is basically very simple. If you want to define a new object, you basically have to give it two arguments. Um, so. Um, the first argument tells you what the output of the reduce is for an empty list. Okay, so if you have an empty list, you've got to give it something. Here you want it to be zero. Um, so it's kind of convenient in Python to just specify the type of the thing. And this is type is actually a function. And if you call it with zero arguments, it will just give you zero. Um, so that's like sort of like a Python pun if you want, right? Um, yeah, it's called. You call it with zero arguments in order to create the. Um, Can I pass like something, for example, one or two, or do I do like 
No, but you could write a zero argument function that just returns. You could write lambda colon zero. That'd be fine. That would work perfectly. Okay. Um, and then the second thing takes in the running sum and the next thing in the list and increments the sum. Right. They don't match. Oh yeah, you're right. That's right. This is not right. Um, there's um, two open parens there, or three open parens, and then four closed parens. Yeah. Okay. All right. So where's the extra closed paren? This one, or that one, either one, right? Okay. Yes. I agree with that. Um, so much I'll actually do it. Okay. Uh, okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Um, so for fun, I'm going to go through the TF-IDF example again in guinea pig. Um, so uh, this is an implementation. Uh, so I'm going to sneak a few things every time, uh, new things in every time. So um, you can pass in extra like user arguments. Um, uh, and the way you specify them, you know, it, well, it tells you when you invoke a program. It's, it's in the tutorial. Um, but um, you know, my, my definition, I basically, if I want to access those, what I can do is I can basically set up a Python dictionary and initialize it this way. So this gives me the parameters, the user's parameters, all right, um, from the command line. Uh, so um, then I can access those. So this is basically say whatever the user told me for the corpus um, is going to be used for the input to read lines. And you know, if corpus isn't specified, I'll use this thing called ID corpus. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to map, right? Okay. So um, this map function here is going to replace um, the ID corpus with uh, something which essentially um, uh, takes the line and splits it by tabs. Strip just drops the trailing new line. Okay, so it's the uh, output of read lines is going to be a string per line in the file. Um, and here I just basically um, turn that into a tuple split by new lines. And then in the next line, I can sort of see I'm expecting that tuple to have two parts, the document ID and the text. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tokenize that. All right. So this is a tokenized version. So ID words is a tokenized version of that. Um, and then I'm going to do a flatten operation. OK, so flat map is the name for that. Um, and um, uh, this is a little bit confusing here. So there's a Python routine. There's a Python art, uh, um, primitive called map. So it's nothing to do with MapReduce except that the map in MapReduce is taken from that kind of functional programming thing. And what that does is it takes a list as its second argument and it iterates over some other function and applies each of those functions. OK. Uh, so um, it's going to go over each word here in the words argument. That's the second argument here. And it's going to pair it up with a document ID. So this is giving me the data that I started with for my TF-IDF example before. OK. So um, uh, there's that. Now there's the document frequency. So this is pretty much exactly what I had in my, in my little abstract model. All right. So I'm going to take the distinct data group by terms. I'll just keep the document ID and I'll count how many times each one appears. OK. Um, and now I want to um, count the um, total number of document IDs. All right. Uh, so um, uh, here I'm outputting a function, which here is a string end doc instead of the number one. But otherwise, it's exactly the same as I had before. All right. Now I'm going to do a few joins, OK, and maps. So I'm going to join these to the um, document ID in terms with the term frequency. This gives me exactly this pair. OK. So one little hitch here. Um, so Python's um, uh, 
way of taking structures as an argument um, uh, is somewhat limited. So um, I use term twice because they're the same value in my example. Um, if I do that, Python will complain. So I have to give them I have to give them the different variable names. It doesn't know how to sort of check that you know two things appear twice in that structure. Um, so I call these two things. I've given these two different variable names, but I'm doing the same transformation. Okay, so all right, here's the new thing. Okay, um, so the next thing I want to do is I want to do a join. All right, I want to join in this um, end doc relation, which just has this one value, the total number of documents. All right, so there is a join um, operator. I could do a join, which is what I did in the sort of abstract case. Um, uh, but this isn't abstract, this is real. If I type in join, it's going to do a reduced side join. So basically, it's going to pair up those things every possible way. It's going to you know, sort them so it can get all the keys together, right? And then it's going to basically do a reduce that will sort of construct the tuples of the join, all right? And maybe we can do something a little bit faster in this case because this is just a tiny little relation, okay? It just has one row in it. Right? The natural thing to do here would be a map side join. All right? So Python has this special syntax for a map side join. Um, actually, I guess I'm going to kind of go through this later. Um, let, me, uh, let, me, let me use the, for the people in the back here, let's kind of step through what these pieces are. Um, so um, again, here we're constructing these, uh, the data in the same format we had before. This is computing the document frequency, so it's um, each term and then the number of times it occurs in the corpus. All right. Uh, okay. And now I do these joins. So this next thing here is this augment operation. Okay. So it does uh, the following thing. So there's one main argument. So it's doing a map side join. Um, so in a map side join, what you do is you take a small relation and you load it in. And then you do some with it, something with it when you iterate over the data. Okay. <laughs> So the way you do this is, there's, there is you use the secondary view, the one you want to put in memory, and you call that a side view. All right, so this says this is a side view. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to augment this um, uh, input to the join. OK, that's these triples, document term, document frequency, all right, with the contents of that side view. So like I said, that's con that side view has got to be loaded when you start the mapper. So you're going to give it a function to load it. All right, so this is um, a, you know, a built-in routine that will basically take the, that's an argument, a file, and it will verify that it just has one row and return that one row. Okay, so here we'll just get an integer, right, as, my, as, my, um, as the side view. So what happens in the next step, the output here, this udoc3, basically it's gonna be as if it was the output of a join, all right? because we're emulating a join here. And what I've joined in, it, what uh, the second argument of the join here is basically um, whatever object I loaded here, okay? So it's not gonna be like, you know, the relevant, if this is a, if this is a, is, is a big relation that you wanna join against, then what you're gonna get here is the second argument will be that whole relation as a Python data structure, as a list of objects, if that's how you um, decide to join it. Here there's only one thing, so you're always gonna get the same thing. Um, as, you, as you go through. But this is going to pair up that one thing that you loaded here with every row in um, uh, this, um, this first argument view. All right. So this basically gives you the ability to kind of um, stream through with a function that's just defined you know, here in line. Okay, it doesn't have any stored variables, no global variables, nothing that's sort of hanging around. Everything it needs is sort of right here in the arguments that lambda function. And now you can do what you want, which is just find the IDF here. OK, uh, so this is the whole code, all right? Uh, so um, that's kind of what it looks like at the end. So that join was sort of the hard part. And then there's um, this other step here where I um, compute the, uh, the, um, the sum of the squared weights, all right, with a grouping function. All right, so this is another map reduce thing by retaining reduce to, all right? And then finally, I take those things and I join them together. So I've got a document ID and it's um, uh, term weight. It's local term weight. No, I take that back. This is a normalizer. Z is a 
uh, normalizer for that document. And then I got the document ID again. All right. Um, those things will always be the same because it's a join. The term and the weight, and I just compute what the final weight is supposed to be. All right. Okay. So, uh, are there questions? How did we get the normalizer? So it's computed right here. Okay. Um, so what we're doing is we're grouping together these unnormalized document vectors, which are basically triples. A document ID, a term, and the weight of that. The weight, which is the weight for that term in the document ID, in that document. All right. And I'm uh, constructing a normalizer for each document ID, so that's the key. All right. All I really want to keep is the weight. Actually, I want to keep the square of the weight because I want to get this, the square root of the sum of squares of the weights, the Euclidean distance. Right. And then I'm going to just sum those things up. So this here is the way I get the normalizer. Does that make sense? OK. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, once again, I'm going a little bit slower than I expected. Um, but um, I think actually I'm going to plunge ahead a little bit. And uh, we'll finish up uh, on Tuesday or go a little bit further on Tuesday, I guess, uh, next week. Um, so I'm going to talk about another algorithm. So um, uh, this is actually one of my favorite um, algorithms. Um, I, I, so I got really interested in this, this like sort of problem in the 90s. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about for a little bit is something called a soft join or sometimes a similarity join. All right. Um, so I want to spend um, the next five minutes and then probably some of Tuesday. Um, talking about um, uh, methods for solving this particular problem. This is very closely related to k-nearest neighbor type things. All right. So um, I got interested in this problem um, because I was interested in um, um, matching up data from different sources on the internet. Um, so one particular problem you have when you look at that sort of data is that um, the names of things aren't always completely consistent. So one place you might have Carnegie Mellon, some place you might have Carnegie Mellon University, right? Sometimes you'll have Carnegie with a, Mellon with a dash, sometimes you'll have it without a dash. Sometimes it will be capitalized, sometimes it won't be capitalized. Um, so there are lots of small variations in the way names are used. So in a real database, of course, you have an object identifier, right? So whenever you want to talk about CMU, you have like object identifier 137, right? It's some internal thing that you use so you can be perfectly clear about it. Um, if you take two databases from two different places, they won't have those kind of consistent keys. So figuring out whether two names refer to the same thing is actually a complicated problem. Um, so um, I, uh, I guess I won't read this, but you might want to read this if you're like getting bored taking the quiz or something. This is from this great book called True Names. So um, in this story, it's basically a whole bunch of hackers. and um, so um, the way you get power over another hacker, and they're like, like wizards in this story, right? It's like the age of magic. You know, hacking is like magic. The way you get power over someone is you figure out their true name, right? Which is, let's say, their Andrew ID, right? <laughs> so, you know, an actual identifier for that person, and then, you know, they're in trouble because they've been doing illegal things and, and you know all about them. So, um, so this is basically the issue when you're looking at, at data you know, from the web. You might get a whole bunch of knowledge bases. Um, uh, and particularly, I'm thinking about things you've basically scraped off websites. So how do you take those things and set them up so you can do joins across multiple knowledge bases? So they'll probably have human readable names for the objects, but they may not have consistent identifiers. Okay? If you're very lucky, they might have you know, IMDB database movie database identifiers or something like that, but often they don't. Um, and these can actually be pretty difficult problems. So um, back in the 90s, I looked at a, this in detail in a couple of cases. So one was educational games. So um, these circles are um, companies that I believe to be the same or uh, games that I believe the same, to be the same. So I think Lion King animated story back is the same as the Lion King storybook, right? And I think these things are the same. Um, uh, these are things that are not the same. Uh, 
or you know, maybe it's like arguably the same or not the same. So um, let's see. So a mallard is not the same as a Mariana mallard, even though there's a lot of textual similarity. Um, so an Aleutian Canada goose is actually endangered. The Canada goose, of course, as we know, is more of a pest than uh, an endangered species. And you know, there are other things. So it's like, um, you know, if you're looking at a database of products, um, so is Microsoft the same as Microsoft Kids? You know, it's not really obvious, right? Um, there's certainly some financial, you know, organizational difference, but you know, maybe the Microsoft Kids games are, you know, better than the ones that are just Microsoft branded. I don't know. So whether you consider two things the same is, to some extent, application dependent or query dependent. Um, uh, and um, you can get very surprising um, degrees of dissimilarity for things that you want to be the same, and vice versa, similarity for things you want to be different. So um, I also looked at this problem like five or six years ago. I was visiting Google for a year as a visiting scientist. Um, so here in Pittsburgh, one of the big problems, one of the big groups works on um, shopping, right? So if you want to do comparison shopping, you have to know whether two products are the same or not, OK? So these products are actually very different, OK? Um, the only thing that's different about them is these, straight, these characters right here and these characters right here, OK? But one of those tables is four feet long, and one of them is eight feet long, OK? So one of them is going to fit in your apartment, and the other one won't. Um, the other thing, and these are also things which are, if you kind of sort it out, are in fact the same product, right? It's some sign of film, camera, right? I don't know what it is. It's some camera gadget, right? And if you work it out, those are the same, but they they're actually look quite different um, uh, textually, right? So this is a non-trivial problem. Um, and sort of figuring out what it is that makes things the same or different um, in general is a difficult problem. Oh my god, what happened here? Oh, that looks perfectly fine here. I didn't change anything. That was, that was Microsoft Kids PowerPoint, I think. Um, so um, one thing you can do is rather than try and do a hard join, you can do a soft join. So a soft join, basically, if you have two sets A and B, all right, these are sets of keys that you want to join on, you, you can generate an ordered list of triples, right, where SIJ is a similarity score for I and, for I and uh, J, okay? And you want these in descending order. Um, usually you don't want to generate all the possible pairings because that would be too many. So usually you want to get the top few triples, right? Or all triples with some high score or something like that. So this is the basic idea. And I guess on Tuesday we'll come back and we'll talk about how we can do that with MapReduce sorts of tools. All right. That's, at a, that's all for now. <laughs>